Imagine if after World War II, uh, in sorting through the ruins of Berlin or some or Tokyo, we had come upon uh, uh, laboratories where a drug was being produced that so virulent that when released into human populations, you could create a situation where uh, 20 or 30 years after its introduction into a society of hundreds of millions of people, those people would use this drug on an average of six to seven hours a day being spent under the influence of this drug. This is, in fact, what television is. <laughs> television is a technological fix introduced into this country after World War II. And the statistics are that the average American average watches six and a half to seven hours of TV a day. Now, just because you don't inject it into your good right arm doesn't mean that you don't have to look at the consequences of this kind of behavior. And one of the things that I'm very interested to communicate and that I think must be communicated to the society, or we're never going to have a mature dialogue about what's going on, is the fact that the pro-psychedelic position is an anti-drug position. And that, in fact, what is going on are consciousness wars. Wars designed to determine shall we or shall we not be conscious? And how conscious shall we be? And the government is in the business of peddling deep unconsciousness. It's utter toleration for uh, television, the unregulated nature of television's content, and just the scurrious garbage, scurrilous garbage that is tolerated going over the media, the government's tolerance for booze, the government's tolerance for heroin, and in fact its cynical use of heroin to eviscerate the political intent of the ghettos in this country, the government's tolerance of cocaine and its use by the yuppie class in order that the government have a source of income to prosecute its dirty little wars throughout the world. You see, all that the third world has to sell is drugs, and they can sell them to the, to in, into the United States and get hard currency, which they can then take to the CIA and translate into guns. And then the CIA has hard currency off the books to pay for its wars throughout the world. This is the real hard drug cycle that is going on in the United States. Meanwhile, what the psychedelics stand for and have always stood for is the dissolving of unexamined habitual behavior patterns. And after all, isn't that what we object to about hard drugs? Isn't that what is so offensive about the anything addict? The heroin addict, the television addict, the thing addict, is that when it comes time for their fix, whether it be saint elsewhere or whatever, do not stand in these people's way. You know, they are going for the button, they are going for the syringe, whatever it is. Uh, unexamined, habitual behavior that is self-destructive and socially destructive is intolerable. It is also the absolute antithesis of uh, what psychedelics do. They break up unexamined habitual behavior patterns. They call into question cultural assumptions. They do not dull, they do not deny, they do not fill time. So they are truly psycholytic and therefore uh, truly politically potent. And uh, one of the things that I would like to bring front and center 
in any political dialogue about these things is the fact that the psychedelics are, to my mind, the major force for a serious feminizing of society. Feminism got a great distance on the fact that no one could deny, or no reasonable person could deny, that it was a good idea. You know, equality of women, equal pay for equal work, caring men, sharing uh, child, all these things, great idea. And that propelled it for its first 10 years, and then it seemed to hit a brick wall of recidivism. And, uh, and social resistance. This is because you can't cut it with a good idea. That's not enough. Look at disarmament. There's a good idea that went nowhere for a long, long time. So I think feminists, deep ecologists, all of these people need to overcome the trauma and the stigma of uh, any reasonable effort to discuss the role of psychedelics in society. We have essentially been screamed into silence. Other than talking to a group like this, where you know I practically know every one of you by name and your past history. I mean, this is hardly a public gathering. So other than living room talks like this, it is, it is almost impossible to get a hearing uh, on this issue. And it has to do with uh, an impoverishment of language and a complete co-option of the vocabulary necessary to discuss the problem by the other side. I mean, the other side just screams, drugs, drugs, and you're supposed to fall silent and uh, not say a word about it. It's so shocking and unthinkable. I mean, I, people come to my lectures who agree with everything I say, who won't smoke a joint in front of their children, you know, because that's how powerful the wedge is that has been driven between parent and child in an effort to communicate uh, what this is. That actually, you know, we're like Jews before Auschwitz. We're affected with some kind of deep inner guilt where we actually agree with our oppressor on some impossible level. So we're carrying this kind of contradiction inside ourselves. Well, uh, what, ha what needs to be done, and I referred to this earlier in a different context, is we have to evolve language. We have to make a distinction between synthetic drugs and plants. Not, a, not an academic distinction, not a distinction under a larger heading, but to actually say, no, these things are as different as tricycles and donuts. They have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And this has been a difficult split to make because, uh, first of all, we haven't really, I think, seen how high the stakes are. And there have been hybrid cases that spread confusion in the community. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of MDMA. You know, many people think this is a fine thing. Well, it's obviously a synthetic drug. It can be manufactured in laboratories in doses of minions and so forth and so on. So what about it? Isn't, isn't it just as good as a plant? Well, the answer is no for those reasons. That anything which can be criminally syndicalized and produced in boxcar-sized lots and uh, sold as an unidentifiable something in a capsule plays into the hands of this male-dominated consumer psychology that uh, is destructive. And you could also even attack the substance on a uh, for-itself argument and say, you know, amphetamines ultimately are not uh, constructive in the social situation. Uh, I would like to solve the problem by just uh, saying we have a cornucopia of shamanically validated substances that range over a wide gamut 
that all the way from slight stimulation to uh, an unimaginably intense psychedelic breakthrough. And all of these compounds have been used over tens of millennia. They are use proven. We know they don't cause miscarriages or tumors or chromosomal breakage because they are part of the legacy of uh, our history on this planet. So then it isn't so much a matter of uh, seeking through pharmacology uh, ever more and varied kinds of consciousness altering things. It's more about trying to get back to our roots and trying to get the most benign plant person relationships possible put in place. And uh, I think that uh, in the indoles, we have this. And that this is a good way to think of it because it's, it can be understood by our critics because they are reductionists and materialists. So if we say to them, the indoles are the special category, we will save 90% of what we want to save and exclude 95% of what we wish to exclude because the indoles are the lysergamides, the beta-carbolines, the tryptamines, and the iboga alkaloids. And I think that that is a sufficient spectrum with their antimers, endantimers, cogeners, and so forth, that uh, we can do what we need to do politically and for our own spiritual group and remain within uh, that small then and try to create a redefining of what these things are. <laughs>